Chris Gleason started Glee Coffee Roasters with his brother Ben. They live and breathe specialty coffee. They know coffee is central to every good day. Glee's promise is to source, roast, brew and pour each cup of coffee with the utmost care. And because of that, they only work with ethically sourced beans. Chris, welcome to the podcast. Hey, good to be here. Thanks for having us. Welcome, mate. Milk or no milk? No milk. I black like my soul. It's very, very dark there. How do you have it though? Uh, Tiny I, espresso or the long black? How do you have it? Well, right now, uh, I, I've recovered from milk. I used to have 14 lattes a day. That was like when I was first getting into the industry. And that was because I was making coffee for other people, like in a showroom. And so I'd make them one for them, one for me selling them coffee machines. And so now I just, I went way away from milk and, um, and I now just drink a double espresso um, every chance I get. Mm. So, Are there still 14 a day in there? No, I'd be at about, uh, if you, a double espresso is like two standard drinks. And so I'm probably hitting about 10 standard drinks a day. Wow. And before you owned a coffee business, mm. was that the thing as well? Like still... 14 coffees. Well, that was, yeah, that was when I was in a, a employment space in coffee. Before then I was probably on, yeah, like probably just one a day before then. And then, then off, off I went, I got the, got the bug for it, <laughs> fell in love with it. And yeah, like the rest is history. You talked about a milk addiction there that mm. appears to be a bit of a caffeine addiction. Where, 100%. When did that begin? When did the love of coffee start? The love of coffee kicked off for me. Uh, originally I, I was anti caffeine and anti-coffee as a young adult I was probably 18 years old 19 and my brother Ben had fallen in love with coffee and bought a little Krups um, coffee machine and we he had some pre-ground coffee and he was talking all through it and I my rhetoric was always why would you want to make yourself drink a beverage that you don't like it's like you're forcing yourself to like something bitter it's not it's not a nice drink and he says no 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 it can be good and Anyway, and, and, and we were standing there one day and I was debating it and he literally poured espresso um, over a spoon. I wasn't watching him as he was doing it and then he stuck it in my mouth while I was objecting. Just put that spoon straight in my mouth with the coffee on it and I was like, oh, this is the most disgusting thing I've ever tasted. Spat it out. And then he just finished steaming the milk for a flat white. He says, now drink this. And I drank the flat white and I went, oh, this is heavenly this is the best thing I've ever tasted. And so from there, I was pretty hooked on a cup of joe every day uh, and then eventually moved into the industry and ended up, I think the longer you're in the coffee industry, the more likely you'll um, end up on black coffee because it is a big tax on your body trying to digest and process. He's lactose intolerant too. So. Yeah, I was, <laughs> I was. I'm all, I'm all, I'm back in the, back in the game now, but um, I can have so ice have cream. Milk. Elsewhere, but not with coffee. Oh, ice cream, man. Ben and Jerry's, <laughs> right, you know. So, yeah, it's, that, that was the story of getting into, getting into it. it. was I was forced. <laughs> so, so going from no coffee mm. to addicted to coffee yep. to then starting a roasting business, how, how do you go from one extreme to the other? Well, well yeah, I, I, I think it was a natural progression for me from – that moment there, I got into coffee, and my my life was probably a bit of a, a bit of a wreck, to be honest. I was, I mean, whose life is really sorted out when you're 18, 19 years old? But I had, uh, you know, done pretty poorly at school, and I've always showed promise. That's what my teacher said. Then I decided that I would um, enrol in a journalism course, and got so far in a journalism course. I think it was into semester uh, semester three and got to um, the ethics side of it and, and I couldn't do it. The, the way I was being mentored or, or taught in that space, I, I, I just walked out of the class. I tried the next year, went through again to try to do it again, got to the same class. I couldn't stomach it. I walked out, had a big, big fight with the teacher um, in the class and walked out, uh, did a weird thing, like threw my phone in the bin, like deleted all my contacts, my girlfriend in Sydney, like I just, I, it was like a little bit of a weird mental breakdown, went, um, jumped on a train, went home um, and then just found a job back in retail. Like I was like, 
always be up to that point. I'd always been able to like sell jeans. And so I went and worked with General Pants and like kind of just got back on the life wagon there. And um, that lasted for a little while. My brother, who's six years older than me, Ben, and classic big brother, um, you know, it's like, mate, you've got to get your life sorted out, got to get a career. And he at that point had got into coffee um, and was working with Toby's Estate Coffee, at, you know, which at that, you know, that time was like the apex of um, coffee roasting, you know, one of the real pioneers of specialty coffee in Australia. And he said, you've got to get your life sorted out. Get it. And I said, oh, yeah, you know, easy for you to say, classic younger brother kind of attitude. And uh, mum and dad were moving away, which meant my free rent was – going and I became my brother's problem like um so I was all of a sudden living in my brother's garage uh, <laughs> and thanks mum and dad but you know they had to do what they had to do and so he got pretty motivated for me to get work um because I was living in his garage <laughs> as you do <laughs> and yeah <laughs> and so I thought I thought we were good mates but he wanted me to get out there and so he got this um job opportunity offered to him in coffee which was uh uh, importer of Italian espresso machines, like the top end ones back then, you know, it would have been like three and a half thousand dollar machines and for said, home use or for home. Yeah, yeah for, home. and they had a cafe side as well, like a but their real big seller was this beautiful home machine called the Giotto, and it's a wonderful still machine still today called Rockets now. But um, he <coughs> got off of this job and he lied to the guys and said, Oh, I can't take it because of I'm really enjoying my work at. Toby's estate, but my brother is totally into coffee machines. And so he called me up and said, you've got a job interview tomorrow. Um, it's in um, North Shore, Sydney. Um, here's, a, here's a blog to read, like a, an article um, to understand. To what, learn. To learn about it. <laughs> so I crammed about, so, and I was, I was up for it. I was like, well, I, I need a job. And so I then, yeah, moved my life down to Sydney, got the job, aced the interview, worked with some of the best people. And it was a small business. There was about five of us that were working there. Um, really, like, and to this day, still really close friends with um, my then boss, um, Charles, and kind of saw what, I, that's where I kind of felt like I began to get my work ethic and my love for coffee. Like, all of a sudden, I went from just being the casual coffee um, cafe drinker to I had to make an a incredible cup of coffee because when people would come in to test our machines, the sales pitch is, this machine is going to make you incredible coffee. So my skills had to really go up. So every opportunity I got, I'd go down to the showroom, make everyone a cup of coffee, hence the high addiction of 14 cups. Then from there, we, you know, the business succeeded. It had some challenges and I learned what it was like to see a small business owner under pressure, like, and, you know, um, a whole supply chain dried up and, and, and really, you know, as, as my best, as best as I could, really tried to help navigate through that and we did, we, we got through it. And then my brother started to get the itch to start his own business. He, and we were in the same industry, the same vein. We saw a big gap in the market on the central coast. Like at that point, there wasn't a specialty coffee roaster and on like at all. Um, the, all the good coffee came from Melbourne or Sydney or Brisbane. And, and we looked at it and went, let's give it a red hot crack. Despite experiencing the pressures of the small business that mm. you'd gone through yeah. in the years earlier, yeah, and that, that it was a good business, like and and still is, like uh, and but you know they were his my boss was a classic loyalist. He had one brand, so the one machine that he imported was his brand in the country. So it's like, um, you know, it's like importing you know um, a certain one product and it's, and use everything, all your eggs in one basket, you brand yourself that product. And it's like, and that's what, that's the kind of person he is and I really admire him. But that that whole supply chain dried up overnight. And he had no other product. And he had no other product. Yeah, so right. that was, and weird, that was kind of where I discovered some of my skill sets was we would just, I'd just stay there till 11 at night, finding new products, um, just like figuring out how to do it. And I was, at that age, I was, I was 20, uh, 21 years old. And I learned what it was to kind of sweat for a business, you know what I mean? And, and get in there and put the hard work in. And he was a hard, and he is a hard worker. Like classic Charles, we would all get to work at eight in the morning and then you'd get to seven at night and you'd try to sneak out of the office without him noticing and you go, Chriso, are you going home? And, he, and he'd look at his watch and he goes, oh, I guess then, no worries. See you tomorrow then. 
right? And and he was a hard worker, but a, gr- a great guy, but a hard worker. And I think I learned a couple of lessons in that as well of like, if you want to make something work, like it's just not going to happen nine to five. It's just not going to happen like super cruisy. You've got to be willing to dig in and, and um, sweat a bit. So yeah, I learned a lot there. And I think that was the thing, got to the point of, I think I'm, I am ready to roll the dice. And I knew that if it didn't work, Charles would have me back. Like that was my other kind of backup was, I knew Charles would take me back. Like we really got along well. And so I thought kind of safe enough to give it a red hot crack. Wow. So, so you, you know, you make the move, you know, yeah. just, just for everybody's sake, explain roasting, you know, just, just yeah. to understand it, just in a short version. Short version of roasting is, uh, is we receive coffee that's been, uh, was originally from a fruit. Uh, it's a seed of a fruit. The fruit's removed, the seed is dried. So it's kind of similar to like, if you imagine like a sultana with a big, huge, hard seed in it, that's what a coffee bean kind of is like once it gets dried out. All of the fruit's removed, it gets dried out to like, it feel, It actually looks like and feels like a stone. And it's impervious and really like you can't chew it. It's like trying to chew rocks or pebbles. We get all these things um, exported from overseas, imported to our factory, and we receive them there. And it's similar to like a popcorn kernel. At that point, if, if like by definition, you apply heat to it. This is what we do in the roasting process. We apply heat, um, heat, heat, heat. And then eventually, in a moment, it cracks. And it's this magic reaction called pyrolysis where like, a, you know, hundreds of thousands possibly of chemical reactions all happen in a couple of seconds. And, you know, that's where the, like in popcorn, pop, 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 it just goes soft from this hard little rock to this soft, fluffy thing. And so coffee does the same thing. So it cracks um, and, it, and it's not, and it's then at that point, it's like it's, um, it can be crushed. But before you could actually, um, you could wheel around trolleys on it. It's like, it's, it's fine. So the coffee, yeah, that's, that's kind of what coffee roasting is. And then our job is um, to blend it appropriately to make sure it gets the right flavours and then we deliver that in a certain time frame to whoever's going to use the coffee. Um, when we see food. blend, what does that mean? And what, what, how is your blend different to Toby's estate? Yeah, well, uh, the, main, the, main, the main thing is the ingredients that you use. So, uh, you know, coffee is a real worldwide commodity. You've got um, different countries that produce it. Uh, that certain countries are better at producing it than others because of the natural climate. They've got an advantage. Generally, countries that are around the, um, the equatorial belt um, have a huge advantage. So like countries like uh, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, uh, Brazil and uh, like Ethiopia on the other side of the world in, in, in Kenya, really good coffee growing regions, Tanzania. And so they're all kind of in that hot zone um, and they have to have high altitude. So we get a whole bunch of those and then we, um, and then they come in different grades. So depending on the grade you've, of coffee you choose can generally dictate the quality. But then really what you're doing is you're grabbing all these different ingredients and sometimes they're the same. So Toby's and I might have like crossover, like on the same beans in our blend. Depending on the ratios we use of them and the style in which we roast them, we're going to get different, different, flavor, um, different flavor beans. So a single origin, not a blend? Not a blend. Right. Yep. It's from one place and when you roast it, it there's nothing else going in. Absolutely. And single origin can be, again, that's a wide range. Single origin could be just Ethiopia coffee, um, like from a certain region. But then when we've even gone down now to what we call like micro lot, where it's, it's one farmer, it's one crop. And, uh, and with the internet um, these days, it's been a huge advantage for us to provide feedback um, to the growers. And also it's been quite socialist in some kind of ways because the grower has been able to see how much we sell the product for like over the years and gone, ah, holy mackerel. Yes. Like I should be charging more for my product, yeah. which is incredibly amazing for the industry because most sourcing sides of um, most source in most businesses that source industries that source all around the world, there's always opportunity for corruption. And um, the coffee industry has fought really hard over uh, the last 15 years of trying to eliminate systemic corruption in the industry. And where we are now as to where we were is just, um, chalk and cheese. It's we've made a lot of progress. So very good. Yeah. Um, so you know, we know that you know how to make a good <coughs> coffee bean. You know how to mm-hmm. create good flavors. Um, how do you run a good business? How do you start <laughs> it? How do you market it? All those sorts of things. Because yeah. it's you, you. You could be the best at what you do mm. and have a terrible business. So talk us through that process. Well, yeah, I mean, like technically, we don't have the best business in the world. 
um, by any stretch of the imagination or even in the coffee industry. Uh, and that's, you know, we run a good business. But like we, I mean, 2019, we roasted a coffee for a coffee competition called the Golden Bean, which has international reach as well. And there's a Amer- North American one and an Australian one. And my brother Ben, like he is a freak of a coffee taster. Like, and that's, that is a thing, you know, coffee has more, um, more uh, discernible flavors than wine, like, uh, and whiskey and all those things. So coffee is actually, uh, I think it's only second to tea. And I could be wrong on that stat as well. It could be the other way around. But coffee is so sensory and there's so much potential flavors. And my brother Ben is one of the best flavor um, tasters there is. He is brilliant. So he's always run our blends and he's also always designs that stuff. And, uh, but, he designed the blend in 2019 and we called it Walking on Sunshine because it was like uh, it was like Walking on Sunshine. It was like tropical kind of flavours, like big, bright, but still earthy. Anyway, and we just submitted it in a competition and we ended up winning the competition, which that's great. Like, but someone wins it every year. So, or whatever. But, the, when but we the, you won that year. So we won yes, that year, yeah. so that was yeah. good. Yeah. And you go, oh, wow, we won. And, you know, it was, it was a big deal. But when we looked at the scoring sheet, we realised – to that date in all competitions, um, if you appropriate the scales and the different scoring methods, we had created the best tasting, co- the best scored coffee of all time. So much that, so that it was reviewed three times because of the incredibly high score it was given, right? And we go, wow, this is going to change our business. We've got the best product in the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've, we've nailed it. Um, admittedly, it's not something we could actually afford to supply cafes, right? It was just a really show off incredible coffee. You know, it helped our business, but it doesn't mean just having the right products and the best product isn't going to necessarily mean that everything's going to change for us. We need, we've had to commit to some hard lessons over life. We've had to commit to learning and we've had to commit to growing. We've had to commit to like changing even when people like, um, you know, when you just kind of, when you just kind of want to do the same thing you did last year, that, that should be a bit of a warning sign for you as going, am I actually becoming a better business owner? Am I growing in the way that I treat my staff? Am I growing in the way that I improve systems? So for me, like when we started off, marketing probably wasn't that important. Um, Debt collection was. (laughs) That was like the first thing for us. We, the first hard lesson we learned was business partnership. We partnered with another group and um, we're friends with that group um, again today, but there was a really hard lesson of we had to um, go our separate ways in our first 12 months with our business partners and that was really challenging. What, what, why is that? I mean, I don't want to delve yeah, into it too no, much, sure. but why did you have to separate? Uh, it was – so they were based out of another city and we were kind of – we'd paid money to be a part of a group and so – and for us then it was, it was $25,000 and it was real serious investment. They didn't really come to the party on providing some of the promises that they said they would. They came to the party on the equipment um, there was some equipment there and, uh, but you know, for that 12 months, I didn't earn a cent and I was, we we're technically business owners, unemployed, putting any sales that we get into some kind of other, like another bank account that we had no access to. <laughs> and I wasn't getting paid cause I was class, I was a, I was a, sh- I was a shareholder. And so I'm just growing the business, growing the business to the point where I was with my, one of my shareholders, the main guy. Um, up in this other city and I was, I'd sold everything. Like I didn't have a car anymore. And so I was in his spare car and it'd given me the keys for the car to drive back. And like I said, there's no bad blood now, but I was standing in, I was standing there and I was really uncomfortable and he's looking at me, he goes, why are you uncomfortable? Just take the car. And I said to him, I said, it's a five hour drive and I don't have money for fuel. I got nothing. Like, and I was, and he's like, oh, what? Oh, go get some money out of the ATM. I was at that, I was at that point of, I'm like, I'm busting my guts. Like I'm working all week and I'm getting nothing for it. And so things had to change in that, in that scenario. In hindsight, "Hmm." could you have done it without that group? Uh, I think it gave us a confidence to start. Um, We were trying to do it without them. And then again, you've got to be really careful in terms of like, when you've got a business idea of, of actually who you go to, some like, um, and it's all worked out and that's fine. But I remember we were just trying to buy a piece of equipment off someone and we ended up in a business deal with them. We ended mm. up in partnership. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? Like we never yeah. sat down and gone, what's our strategy? What's our 10 year vision and plan for the company? Like what outcomes are we trying to get? All of a sudden we're in, giving someone $25,000 and we're in partnership. And um, so look, I mean, we, we ended up in a really beneficial, out, with a really beneficial outcome, had to like learn a couple of lessons, take a few brave steps and have some big conversations. Uh, and, you know, and in the end, my ambition with that was to make it right with them because it was a couple of years that was difficult and we didn't like each other much. But then two years later, we, um, you know, we gave them the equipment back and said, you can have the equipment. We want this to be good long term. And so it was like big lessons and, um, and to both parties credit, ours and theirs, we're all, we're all really good friends again, like um, over the years. But yeah, it was, it was tricky. I think it gave us a necessary confidence and even to some degree, I'm not sure if I carried the motivation that was required, even being in a small business beforehand to get out there and work the product. But I had the fear of this guy that was more experienced in business, kind of making sure he'd call me up. Where are you going today? What are you doing? Oh gosh, I just rolled out of bed. Like I'm starting a business, man. Like, you know, like just chill out. Like, I, you know, I'm going to go to the beach first and then I'm going to like go do some work. Like now he drove me like, potentially into the ground like but I think we got out just at the right time and from there at that point we had we had some coffee on hand we had a piece we had a factory bay with a lease uh, which we accepted liability for the lease um, in exchange for something else and uh, because we'd gone separate ways the, the company dissolved and so we had a handful of customers and I needed a bit more coffee to make orders but I had no money and so I called up our suppliers and, and our suppliers are always um, cash on um, uh, COD, right? And so it's like, oh, and I had to beg them. Again, I said, look, I've got, I've got 150 kilograms of customers, like of kilos that are going out this week. I need, I need a couple of bags of coffee. I will pay you as soon as I'm paid. I drove around, uh, drove around the cafes, I reckon, seven times that, that weekend to make sure I got every last bit. Um, so we could pay the bill and then from there on we were away. But at that point, so Glee Coffee at its probably its truest inception, um, I had about 500 bucks left. <laughs> and so we just committed to the customers we had and off we went. Yeah, and, and that's the thing in business, you know, a lot of people, well, I think something like 80% of businesses mm. fail in the first five years. Mm. You could have. Absolutely. You, yeah. you could have just gone, I've got nothing left. I can't afford mm. fuel or this is too hard or, you know, I don't Charles have will machinery. take me back. Yeah, yeah, yeah Charles, Charles will just, take me back. Well, my friend know? said to me, my best mate, like, I mean, my best mate said to me, he goes, you're an idiot. <laughs> He's like, you are not wired for business. Like that is, the, you are the last person I would ever think could actually do this. And he, he like meant well, meant very well. He says, I want you to call Charles back. And go and and say you're sorry and go back and work for him because you can't do it. And I was like, and that really motivated me <laughs> to make it work. It really did. Is, like, <laughs> is that like even you know going back to the school days? Mm. You know, um, you know, I don't like this. I'm walking out. I'm throwing my phone at yeah. them. Whatever it may yeah. be, this was like That's your it. screw you moment. I'm going to plow on through. And as you say, it was the motivation mm. and the kick in the guts to kind of go. Well, yeah. no, I'm not going to see Charles. I'm going to make yep. this work. I think I'm authority defiant. Like I still feel that today in um, some other areas of my life. I still, when authority really tries to flex on me, a part of me just wants to like not be controlled. Uh, and so, you know, that's, and that's something you've got to channel, I guess, like and not let it limit you. But if you can let it ma be a, a maximizer in your life, I think most of the time I've been able to do that. Um, been able to find the balance of not just throwing the towel in, but using it to motivate me to go forward. And, but yeah, that was... Yeah, those, those were the kind of big things I was wrestling with. And I mean, growing up, I'm the most disorganized um, person there is. And again, like in terms of making business grow, probably my default personality would be I'd be more into like creative marketing and stuff. I've had to, I've had to adapt and become a person of systems and a person of processes and a person of managing money. Like that was, and, you know, it's what I'm more passionate about is things like music and, and art and, um, and I love coffee because of the sensory side of it as well. But if I, want, if I want the business to grow, I just can't float around with a beret 
on, on my head, just like high-fiving everybody. Like you have to, you know, take responsibility, get into the driver's seat and learn the skills you've got to learn or staff the skills if you're fortunate enough to be able to afford um, someone to come in and staff those weaknesses. So you talk, you know, I mean – the four P's of marketing. Let's go old yep. school, uni days, right? <laughs> so product, yep. nailing it, mm-hmm. award winning, right? Yep. Now, another one is price, we'll get to that, but mm-hmm. promotion, mm. you know, branding, all those sorts of things. How have you done that? And was there a sort of a thought process to mm. nail that promotion part? Sure, yeah. Um, both my brother and I are quite creative and he um, always took a bit of extra lead on that and has to this day – I has done an incredible job with our brand. I, I even remember our first brand, which was like this. He was a guy that chose Glee. So I'm like, oh, it's so – like our name's Gleason and, and so it's from our family name. But I'm like, is it a little bit on ourselves to be calling it after us? And, you know, at that point we're like, no, Glee, it's really cool. That's a great name. And then dead set, two months later, Glee, the musical show, comes to Australia. And I'm like – we need to change our name. Like, <laughs> Ben, we need to change our name. I'm so ashamed. You know, I'm like, I'm embarrassed. And he's like, this is the best thing that's ever happened to us. <laughs> and I'm like, no, it's not. Like, this show sucks. You know, like, whatever. You know, like, and he's like, I like the show. And he's like, it's going to make the word Glee more memorable and easy for people to say. And he's and like, when they're not even talking about you, yeah. they're talking about that's you. That's right. <laughs> and, he, and he goes, and the show will go and we'll still be here. Yeah. And I was like, oh, okay, okay mate. So it was, it was, a good coincidence. And so he, um, yeah, he kind of handled that. And then that evolved a bit over the years. Uh, we had certain staff members that were good in that angle and they helped us maybe take a step forward. Uh, my wife actually is, wouldn't say that she's a very good designer, but um, she's just got that natural flair to be able to sit, know what she likes and not like. And, and so she really, in terms of that um, presentation of the product and all that stuff, she really she really handles that and does a great job. And so, um, and again, that's a, that's a rabbit warren I could get lost in and probably being hyper creative if I was allowed or if the, or if my partners allowed me to go in there, I'd probably get a good outcome, but I, it would take me two years to like actually get in there and get in that zone where for me, it's like, yeah, I focus more on the, on the product and on how we actually, um, how the business runs. It's, it's my sweet It's spot. important to stay in your lane. Like mm. you could do that. You yeah. could do other things. But it but would take you longer than everyone else. Well, it yeah. just dilutes everything yeah. Yeah. you do because you don't have time. So Absolutely. champion that and stay in your space and dominate it. But and, and enjoy what other people make. Yeah. You know, yeah. like every art appreciator wants to be an artist. And it's like, you know what? Like maybe, maybe I'm not as good as I think I am. And that's why it takes so long. You know, like but enjoy, just sit back and enjoy someone else's beautiful work so so products good Mm -hmm. brands good obviously you know from a social media point of view you do Mm -hmm. really well you know you've got good reach um yeah tell me about price you know it's price is you know it's a commodity product really yeah 100 um you know as much as your one Mm. coffee everyone's got the best coffee yeah actually one of the things i do is i make you know i train people in sales and i make them Mm. sell me a coffee oh really yeah because typically there's mm. milk, there's sugar, there's caffeine. It's all pretty mm. similar. So the point of difference, there needs to be a point of difference, which is usually it. the consumer, right? Yeah. Um, anyway, all that aside, but mm. price, how did you get around that obstacle of commodity product? Yeah, well, we still, we wouldn't be around it, to be honest. Uh, that's It's still a huge determining factor in how well our business is going uh, because we generally sell, the, our, our main business is that we sell to um, cafes. Um, so we we're, we wholesale to cafes. That's our major business. And so most of our customers, we're on a fixed price. Uh, so recently we, we did have to do a price rise uh, on a couple of our products on the website for retail. And that's just, that's as easy as literally me logging into Shopify um, with consultation with a couple of our team members and going, we've got we to lift the price of these products. So they're, they're losing money. Da, 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 done. Wholesale is a whole different ball game. These are people's livelihoods, not their um, Sunday cup of joe that they can have or not. Like this is small businesses, medium-sized businesses, um, so that are fixed in on long-term prices. And so when our prices go up, um, we have to really cautiously navigate how do we stay viable and how do we maintain the relationships and the promises that we've made to um, businesses. And so 
that for us has always been a real, um, a real, a real trick. And, and we've over the years we've absorbed um, a lot of cost, uh, and uh, so that's yeah. Recently, we've like last year we did our first major price rise uh, for for our cafes, and that was like you know. And what really pushed us to that point is that the price we were paying when we first started our business in 2008 um, and the price that we're paying now um, for us to actually buy the product is, is actually more than doubled. And so there was, and there's been many iterations of that over the years, um, many um, fluctuations over that in the years, but um, there's good reason for why it has doubled. And when we looked at the state of the world economy and the coffee economy worldwide, um, something had to change. There was farmers that were because of a language barrier or an education barrier being exploited um, and unknowing to a lot of coffee roasters and cafes and coffee drinkers. Unknowingly, um, there was a huge population. Coffee is one of the biggest um, commodities in the world, second to oil, tr most traded commodity. And I don't know how much, how clean oil is either. But um, it doesn't taste as good. <laughs> yes, doesn't taste as good. That's right. But there was just systemic corruption in there. And so the prices had to become transparent. Movements like Fair Trade, Rainforest Alliance um, came in and really started to expose a bit of the corruption, that, a lot of the corruption that was there. And so in turn, as coffee roasters that are, you know, we're nothing without the coffee growers. Mm. Like I can't grow it. Like we can't grow it to the quality that we need to and to the quantity that we need to service Australia. We can't actually do that in Australia. You, you either got to get one thing. We could get the quantity, but we, we wouldn't get the quality. And so we had to put, we had to change our mindset and go, we're going to be the coffee generation that actually um, redirects the money and the spend to where it's needed most and where it's to some degree deserved most. And um, so then it comes across through our hands and we really did our best to just absorb that gradually because there's a slow moving dial every year. It would go up a couple of dollars. Okay, gosh. But then recently we just had an enormous um, Brazil experience, uh, three seasons of frost, um, which they're the dictator of the world price. Um, if Brazil's price is X, then everyone is X plus something. And so then Brazil's price went through the roof. And then by, by um, you know, the way the market works, every other coffee that we purchased just went, just skyrocketed. You didn't and just ditch Brazil and go Ethiopia. <laughs> we couldn't because yep. Ethiopia is more expensive, more expensive than Brazil. More expensive than Brazil anyway. Wow. It's, the, it's the baseline because it's the largest coffee growing, uh, Arabica growing nation in the world. And so if Brazil, for example, if Brazil kind of comes in at the pound, uh, which is how it all still works, uh, thanks America. But if it comes in at the pound, at, um, you know, $1.30 for the pound, then everything else is scaled up above off the dollar thirty for the pound, and then um, so Brazil like Brazil went gangbusters, like almost doubled in price because Brazil has like a over the years have always had like a secret reserve of of buffer the coffee like years of backup and the backup got exhausted yeah wow and then they had a frost again and then it was, <laughs> it was mental so we so we had to pass that on this time and that was a really big business decision for us one of the trickiest ones we had to navigate and but. Just to be really honest, like uh, 13 years of not really doing a uh, not really doing a price rise, like maybe a little one here and there. Uh, I was overwhelmed by the response that um, that you know uh, small to medium medium sized businesses that we service. They were so accommodating. A lot of some of them said we were waiting for this. Like we knew it was coming, and you know because we could see it happening, we could read the news, and so we're like, man. As a business owner, you can labour over that fear of price, um, pricing you out of the market or pricing you out of a good position, but um, you've got to be really confident. People, I believe that um, most people want you to actually do okay. You know, they don't want to haggle you down till you've got nothing left, you know, like, and so, and if you come across that kind of customer relationship, maybe that's not the right relationship. Well, it's a small business recognising that you were also a small business. Yeah. The, you know. how, how fair is it though? Like, I mean, mm. you've got to have your fair share of value, you know, yeah. value to to be a supplier, to be a roaster, whatever it may be. Mm. Um, how inelastic um, or elastic is your product where to the point where 
a, a, a um, cafe says, I can't go with you anymore. I need to go to someone else because ethically sourced, really important, yep. you know, speed of supply, quality product. Have you thought at what point do they bypass that and go, that's cool, but we need to run a business? Yeah. Like what's, what's the determining or what's the deciding number or percentage that changes that? And, you know, that's, that's, that's an ongoing battle for it's, any business. It's different, like for everyone. So it comes back to their business values, really does. And some, some businesses have clear values and others don't. And so then they're trying to, if you don't have clear values for making those decisions, then you end up in a weird kind of vortex of just trying to, just trying to um, improve your position. But if you know what your values are, so I said one, one customer, um, you know, we moved them on to a different product because they refused to do the price rise. And so that was one of our um, potential angles that if, hey, if you want to remain on Glee coffee, um, you will need to accept this price rise. But we do have a coffee that is priced more affordably um, that admittedly um, has a different, uh, different style of bean in there. So instead of Arabica, it's got Robusta, which is something that's more easily grown around the world. Um, but we just don't prefer the, we don't prefer the flavour. So it doesn't live in Glee Coffee Land. And so we were able to move a couple of customers onto a different different position to support their value. And they're like, can't do it. But then one other guy we spoke with recently and we said, oh, well, because we're trying to review our whole like sales pro approach and how do we do that well with cafe owners? What do cafe owners want in a coffee roaster? So we're kind of in that zone for the last couple of months. We sat down with a guy who is a standout cafe in uh, Newcastle and – we're friends. He doesn't use our coffee. I was, uh, went there with, a, with a, a sales guy and me and we just had a chat to him. So could we just chat to you for a couple of minutes, ask you a couple of questions. We don't want, we're not trying to get your business. Literally I'm asking you because you're an ideal kind of customer for us. Could we get some feedback? The guy was so lovely. We sat smooth, down for 40 minutes. Very smooth. Very yeah. smooth. <laughs> but I wasn't, I genuinely wasn't. Right? Genuinely. You wanted to pick yeah. his brain. Yes. I did because he embodies the kind of customer that I'd like to attract. Um, and, and probably like the real top of the top of the pack. And I said, oh, we said, oh, so you use this other coffee supplier, la, la, la. So like, um, you know, what, why is that? And he immediately had his list of like, well, we we share similar values. We really like their branding. We really love their quality. And, um, and then all this kind of stuff. And, and then he said, and, then, and we said, oh, okay, so you wouldn't change them. He says, no, there's no reason why I would change. And uh, my friend said to him, he said, oh, well, what if we could give you the exact same quality coffee at half the price? And, and I'm like, oh, it's going to be interesting. Um, and the guy goes, I wouldn't change. And we're like, whoa, okay, so why? And he says, well, he says, I am not trying to make cash flow decisions. He says, my main objective in the business is to sell my business for the most amount of money at the end. So he says, I'm, I'm selling my books. And he says, and I'm also selling something that people would desire to buy. He says, so the kind of products I have on my shelf and the kind of things, I want them to come in and feel like they couldn't buy this anywhere else. And I also want them to look at my books and see the areas where I could be saving money. He says, I'm not going to make a money-based decision. And he says, at the end of the day, I want to sell a business that people just desire to buy and they don't care what the price is. And so if they want to get a good value business, they can go find a bunch of them. But this one's the crown jewel. And I was like, that's really, he had his values sorted. So it's like, even if a better price came along, you're not talking his language. So yeah, pricing is important, but I think it just varies from customer to customer, you know, what they're trying to, what they're trying to achieve. So, so, you know, we've talked about those three areas, mm. you know, product, price, promotion. The final one, which is probably a good mm. one to talk about is, through the battle of yeah, okay. place. Yeah. You know, we talked about setting up on the Central Coast, mm. the successes of that, but then you decide to set up in Queensland. Yeah. Yeah. You know, scale. Let's scale. It must be better. That equals Absolutely. more profits, mm. but it doesn't. Yeah, scale's complex. Um, and I think I think every every failure has a silver lining if you can if you can catch it before it catches you. Like um, I'll so yeah, we the story around that is we were doing quite well. Uh, we at that point we have a wholesale roasting business, uh, which is moving along well, and we have uh, part of our strategy then was kind of setting up uh, key cafes of our own to kind of help 
um, you know, get the end user excited about Glee Coffee Roasters and then they'd go check out our, our wholesale accounts and then they'd be excited. They'd go to a cafe, oh, we're using Glee, great. I, I drink Glee at the, at the Glee store. I'm like, cool, great, awesome. Like just trying to get a little bit of brand awareness. That was working well. We had two stores, both on the Central Coast. We'd had one before in Derby Street, which was a really um, beautiful slash weird, um, you know, time of our lives. And, uh, and but the at that point we had two stores, and I think we just shut down Derby Street uh, because we come to the end of our lease and wasn't working with the landlord. And we this opportunity popped up, which is up in Brisbane, and uh, out of the blue, and we're like, oh wow, like. I, and I knew the location. It was a factory bay coffee roaster with a coffee bar right in Brisbane, um, Brisbane South. And uh, it was like, this is a killer spot. And I'd been there. It was busy. We really just leapt into that opportunity. We heard it was available and we went, this is going to be great. Glee Coffee is going to expand into another state. Um, and off we went. We had a pretty strong um, management team. I'd say at that point, you know, it's some really good cafe managers working for us and we had a really good um, like wholesale like kind of team as well. To some degree, this is where we went to our biggest um, staffing setup. So at that point, by the time this cafe was set up and we also decided to take on another one at the same time in um, Mayfield, which was a wicked little space, and all of a sudden we had 68 staff. We started paying um, incredible amounts of rent Every week, uh, we started paying incredible amounts of um, suppliers every week. And also, uh, what was it? Uh, what's that? I've, I've actually erased it out of my mind because I was so traumatised by it. It's when the government charges you money because you've got a certain amount of staff. Payroll tax. Payroll tax. Mm. And the joys of payroll tax. Like, what the heck is <laughs> payroll tax? I'm employing more people. You should be rewarding me. You should me. be helping me out here. <laughs> like, and we're just getting slammed. Anyway, and so in the middle of it, one of the cafes was doing great. We sold it. Uh, it was our Erin Cafe. It, was, it did really well. And so we were like, oh, cool. Like, this is like our first payday as a business. Like, we're really like, this is great. We're doing well. Um, we put a bit of money onto some bills and stuff like that and also took some ourselves, paid down some stuff, as you do. Like, it's not all cream. And then uh, the, I, all of a sudden, about two months later, I, I – I wasn't in the finances at all. I was like in just making sure our business ticked. I'm just like, oh, we can't pay for that. We don't have the money for that. And I was going, hang on, like what's going on here? Like we've slipped, something's gone wrong and we've just, and, and so, but my kind of personality is once I get curious in something, I just completely knuckle down on it. And I, and so I pulled out the books, got into zero and started, um, you know, burrowing away in there and discovered that I reckon we were probably about six to seven weeks away from being cut off from one of our, our major supplier um, and being unable to pay um, pay for the stuff. And this is about probably nine years, 10 years, probably, yeah, 10 years into business. And so we're going, oh my gosh. So um, we, unfortunately, we looked at it and went, the only way we can do this, Brisbane was costing us thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars so every week. So that's where you were bleeding? Big time. If you didn't have Brisbane wouldn't have been weeks mm. away from closure. Not at all. No, we were on. We were in a glorious place. We overextended and then we also had to um, change our staffing arrangements. The original intention of our, um, of our key staff was to support the Brisbane adventure and that kind of, you know, that kind of unfolded and wasn't the case. It didn't work for them. And so all of a sudden we're having to add on more managers up there, more key staff, and we were just over – overcapitalized, overextended, and we had to get out. And we pretty much had to get out overnight. And the other, the lesson for me in that is like, really, you got to make sure, um, we had to make sure, and we've always done it now, that we're regularly reviewing our position, um, not just enjoying the glory year that you're in, because it can be the best year of your life um, for your business, but actually you could, you could be going in the wrong direction. You hadn't noticed the impact Brisbane was having. Absolutely. That's off to you though, because... Mm. I can't remember what it was called, the Boston Matrix or something like that, mm. where it's room for innovation. So you mm. allocate time, you allocate money, and you either develop a star yeah. or a dog. <laughs> In this <laughs> yeah. case, you, de you developed a dog, but mm. what you did do, mm. most people push on through, push on through, mm. but you went, no, nah, this is a dog, let's cut yeah. it. 
you know, sorry to use that expression. Yeah, yeah, it's no. actually scholarly article that one, yep. but it's a dog <laughs> and you cut yep. it, but it means that you live to fight another day. Absolutely. You lick your wounds, you, you know, you, you head mm. off in a new direction or batten down the hatches, but mm. yeah, you've batten down the hatches, but mm. you, you, you actually, you know, have a more successful business from that because I think you Absolutely. said six staff now instead of 68 or something stupid. Yeah. I'm like um, not including, not including directors yep. um, in our company. We've got six staff um, and, that's and far more doable, is it? Far more doable. And you, you realise your limits. Like No payroll tax? No payroll tax. <laughs> uh, we had yeah, we had four cafes. Another one we um, shut um, during COVID, the one in um, Mayfield. And then recently we had the one, we had one more Glee coffee store that we sold to an incredible, um, we actually sold the Erina store and the Wyong store to the same person about two years apart because she was doing really doing well with the Erina store, loving it. Her name's Christina Carlson. She's a legend. And um, so, so do you have cafes at all now? Not, I don't own a cafe. You just roast. Yeah, I've got, I've, we've got one, one physical location where we roast and we do have a place where you can come and sell a door, the coffee, yeah. um, but that's it. You, it's no, no food, anything like that. And is that the future for Glee? Do you think you're out of cafes for a while? Yeah, I, yeah, we kind of, we kind of structured it that way. There was some, um, and to get, to be respectful to the, uh, to the person that bought the business of us as well, we agreed to non-competes and stuff for a certain period of time. And we actually also, as we sign those documents, they're like, this is good for us. As um, creative <laughs> adventurers, yeah. this is good Let's for us to have a, our This means we, we never go back there. do this, <laughs> yes. yeah, right? Like, We've learned our lessons four times over. And we went, let's just do this. So, and look, we did really well out of those cafes. Well, and to be fair, yeah. they are clearly good cafes, and two of them, because someone wanted to buy them. Absolutely. Right? And no one wanted Mayfield or Brisbane, and, that's fine. And it says something when someone buys one thing off you. And so when I called her up to say, hey, we're considering moving the next one. This is about two years after. She's like, I want it. I want it. Like, yes. Like, and so, and we, she still uses the brand Glee Coffee um, and she does an incredible job with it. And we really, we want to focus on our product, our, like um, our wholesale relationships. We love working with startups. Like one of the fun facts with us is about 90% of our wholesale customers, we were there on their first day. I was just at, at a, and it's, it's just a, it's a ritual. It's like for us, for me, it's sacrosanct. Like when we've got somebody using our products, I don't care if they're going to be the best cafe in the world or it's a little like startup combi with a, with a coffee machine in it. I want to be there when they open. Like, and that's, we've always found that's what's worked for us. Like, and so we did that yesterday, a cafe up at Ar um, in Cessnock called Arthur's. First day, um, two guys just launching a, an incredible cafe up there in, the, in Cessnock City. They've chosen Glee Coffee. They've chosen Glee and, you know, lunchtime, I'm up there eating their brisket um, toasty, having a cup of coffee, making sure, you know, they've got everything they need. And that's just always been our niche. And for us to go out to that, that big 60-something staff and you've got managers of this and managers of that and it's like, oh, maybe that's not what we, why we created the company. And really we, we come back to it. We wanted to be um, the master of our own little domain and we wanted to, you know, solve a problem that the Central Coast and Newcastle were facing, which was a lack of specialty coffee um, and provide really good support for that. So we, I feel like we've gone back to grassroots. Well, it's quite the domain. We can't wait to see what the next 10 years have in store. Congratulations on finding your way and being in the percentage that does survive. It really is yeah. a great story. So thanks for being part of the podcast. All good. Pleasure. Thanks for having me.